I'm super excited to introduce this next speaker. Even just seeing this next slide that she's going to show you has me amped. This is such an exciting topic. Um, holography is something that we've all daydreamed about as children um, and have been praying to come to life for a very long time. So um, Alexandra is the co-founder and COO of VividQ. Um, she's got an amazing background in sales and marketing and takes care of literally, it seems like everything at the company, operational activities, financial, legal. So can't wait to hear all your insights um, in, in that background. Also um, works with crazy, insane companies, um, folks you know, Rolls Royce, HBO, um, and has been on every list I think possible for like women in tech, technology, um, under 25, under 25, um, 30, under 30. I'm sure like 40 under 40, 50 under 50, 60 under 60, um, you're doing amazing things. So super excited to um, bring Alexander up on stage and uh, hear all the amazing things going on in your space. Very cool, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for the introduction. Um, I hope everyone can, can hear me. Uh, thank you so much for, for making it back from, from lunch uh, for the presentation. Um, so um, as um, we already mentioned, um, we, we are working on uh, in this exciting area of computer-generated holography and specifically AR display applications. Of this, uh, of this technology. Uh, since I am speaking in the XR enablement uh, session, uh, I will very much be looking at uh, kind of the honest outlook of where we are in terms of AR wearables, what is possible, what have we been doing, and where can we go with the current crop of display technologies, and maybe more importantly, where we actually cannot go with the current crop of display technologies. So um, I um, will kick straight in. Um, and um, when I was looking about, uh, when I was thinking about uh, kind of the, the AR wearable space and trying to figure out uh, where we really are and where computer generated holography can make the biggest difference moving forward, um, I think that we can very much look at AR wearables in terms of kind of functionality and, and technical capability as well. So, um, if we really try to be honest about this, at the moment we are still kind of very much at the shallow end of what AR wearables are capable of doing. Um, so we are quite good at doing kind of a more simple AR um, overlays um, for applications like exercise, navigation, may maybe tech support. Uh, but even the slightly more um, technically complex uh, devices, um, they are still um, they're still limited to, to this basic AR um, interaction for, for training or, or education. Um, and I think that uh, we can probably all agree that when we were getting into this space that's, you know, kind of simple enterprise industrial applications, that's not really where we want this space to go. Uh, this is not really how we are going to uh, achieve this uh, mass consumer adoption. Um, and this extremely exciting space of, of gaming entertainment and what we have recently been calling a metaverse um, is where we have to eventually get to really kick this technology off. The issue is, however, that the currently available uh, technologies, especially on display and optics, they seem to reach that point where it will be extremely difficult to push them any further. Um, so, it doesn't really matter how much better our um, laser beam scanning systems or micro LEDs are going to get. We'll still deal with some fundamental um, requirements that are not met to really push AR wearables into the gaming and uh, entertainment space. So um, since we haven't really met um, some of those requirements, um, I'm going to pose a question of, of how, how can we obviously do that and um, how can we really access the high-end market for um, AR wearables. And since um, I'm representing uh, very much a display company, uh, that's probably not a surprise that the area where I'm going to focus is that we fundamentally need an actual real 3D display. So um, again, um, I probably don't have to explain to majority of, of people in here that um, almost all AR wearables uh, available in the market today effectively uh, project images using the um, stereoscopic display where everything is either projected on one depth plane, um, either a fixed depth plane, uh, which allows for some interaction, or most usually at optical infinity. And what we know about that is that effectively this is not exactly 
what we need for, for a fully interactive AR experience. And I'll address some of the issues that the lack of the 3D display is really causing in today's AR, AR wearables and how we believe computer-generated holography is going to address some of them and um, help us move forward. So um, I think we can all agree that um, AR cannot really deliver uh, realistic experiences without generating 3D display, mostly because our world is, is very much 3D and, uh, and not flat and not fixed at, at one depth plane. Um, so um, effectively, um, by, by using just one depth plane or putting everything at optical infinity, we, we, we make it impossible for our eyes, for the users, to focus and defocus at the same rate or in the same way as we do with the physical world. And this is extremely important, especially for um, for images that we project um, kind of within the like 10 centimeters to two meters from the user, because this is really where our capability of focus and, and the focus our eyes is the strongest. Um, uh, I guess, fun fact, uh, the older we get, the less ability to focus and defocus we have, but we still um, do retain this capability, especially within this 10 centimeters and two meters um, region. So, um, 3D display um, for, for focusing and defocusing, very much a requirement to, to make this happen. Again, um, I think, uh, unsurprisingly, majority of interaction with AR content is also happening within, within this uh, arm's length region. We want to be able to generally interact with the AR content. Um, I think for now, we are very much uh, restricted to simple gestures. I think if uh, anyone who tried HoloLens is kind of aware of this, um, of this gesture or using external peripherals for doing the digital interaction with content. If you do add genuine 3D, if you do add depth perception into the display, you do not need simple gestures that are kind of tricking your brain. You do not need any peripherals. You project the content where you want it to be. So you project the content exactly where you're arm is expecting it to be as well. So if you actually haven't experienced that, um, if you've been to the, to the IMAX cinema, um, especially at the beginning, you have this like very strong sensation of, oh, something that is coming at me is 3D. But effectively, as soon as you uh, reach out your arm, you realize, okay, it's, it's not actually there and the illusion is broken. That's, that's effectively what we have to fix to make those solutions um, scalable. Um, and then uh, finally, um, the issue that we again talk about a lot, uh, virgin's accommodation conflict that makes people sick after using uh, VR AR headsets that are using stereoscopic displays, uh, the absence of, of depth in the image, the absence of depth cues that our brain and our eyes um, expect. Um, causes um, users to effectively feel uncomfortable when using those devices. Um, and even more importantly, <clears throat> because we are projecting everything at one single depth plane, we are getting this massive um, cognitive overload because things that are supposed to be sitting at different depths, things are, that are supposed to be closer and further away from us, they all happen at the same plane. So what we're looking at is effectively just like an additional flat display in front of us, which again, is not good enough for what we really want to call the new frontier in, in AR. So those high-end gaming entertainment applications that require all of those things that I just mentioned to be, to be fixed. Um, we very much believe that computer-generated holography and display applications of computer-generated holography are going to, to help us solve this, um, this issue. Uh, we have been developing solutions for CGH both for, uh, on the software end in terms of uh, high-performance computing, but also um, hardware designs for, uh, for CGH applications in AR, uh, AR devices for uh, four years now. Um, and we very much see a very clear path to, to making this technology enter the space. So um, I think um, many of you will also appreciate that the word hologram or holographic display is probably one of the most abused terms in AR. Um, so if you are an optical engineer, uh, I can reassure you, uh, we do uh, genuine digital holography at VividQ. Um, so uh, just to very simply explain what this process does, um, we compute, um, our range of algorithms compute uh, in real time from any 3D uh, content um, the hologram um, 
in, op in optical terms, so the interference pattern, which is this kind of white noise that you can see on, uh, in the middle of the screen. Uh, and this hologram is then presented on the spatial light modulator. So the micro display, um, most often phase or amplitude LCOS, we are expanding into DMD uh, displays um, soon as well. So very much off the shelf stuff. So this is extremely important. We do not need to develop any um, advanced micro lens arrays or any type of advanced display hardware to be able to do this. We use off the shelf micro displays to um, present those interference patterns on, uh, illuminate it with, um, with lasers or, or LEDs to create this 3D projection. Um, so again, as you can see from this like very simplified optical, um, optical um, system, uh, this allows for applications not only in AR wearables, but also extended applications in, for example, automotive HUDs or soon also um, actual gaming um, laptops where you project the hologram in front of the screen but um, those I'll not be talking too much about um, today. Um, so here is a very simple fun GIF that we put together using uh, that system in our, in our uh, lab in, in Cambridge in the UK. Um, so this is filmed directly through the um, combiner. So this is an, a genuine uh, 3D projection of two little dinosaurs, one sitting at the arm's length distance on the, on the flower pot, the other one sitting in the background on, that, on the table. Uh, there is no eye tracking uh, in this, so we are refocusing the digital camera when we are capturing the image, basically showcasing that we present the complete wavefront to the user. So you see all the depth planes at once, you, you as a user decide where you want to look and where you want to focus your eye gaze. Um, so apart from the natural depth of field, there is a range of other benefits of using CGH as a display system for AR wearables. Again, I'll not be getting into all of them, but um, you might have heard about the um, the iBox and, and field of view trade-off that is popular in, in holographic display. Uh, I'm very happy to say that we have been dealing with that issue as well and we are actually going to be releasing the design of the first 3D capable waveguide that retains 3D information uh, within, um, within smart glasses even by using, using a waveguide. Uh, we are using uh, as low power um, systems as possible. We very much want this technology to be as scalable as soon as possible. So um, we are looking at displays that effectively do not, are not going to burn your face as well, um, even when, when, uh, when um, we are using them in untethered uh, devices. Um, apart from that, small form factor, so coming back to the question of the, of the waveguide design, um, and we do some of the other work around that as well, uh, we have a proprietary optical engine uh, as well that we are licensing alongside our SDK, uh, at the same time retaining high image quality. So um, the, the speckly holograms that are usually only in green are long gone. Um, CGH has gone way beyond that, um, especially over the, the past five years, um, and now being driven even more by, by AR and metaverse applications. Um, so how do we actually deliver this solution as, uh, as VividQ? Um, I mentioned that um, we effectively are a software and IP licensing company, so we started off uh, by developing this super efficient um, algorithm for computing those interference patterns, something that used to take um, hours on a stack of GPUs. We can um, already do it on a, on a mobile uh, GPU, and we are very much looking to, uh, to move on to more dedicated uh, SOCs as we go into untethered applications. Um, but also a range of APIs that allow us to use any content um, that already has the XYZ coordinates or uh, 3D information. Uh, we have an API for Unity Game Engine and a number of, uh, of CADs. We are um, hoping to move on to Unreal as well for the gaming applications that are very much our focus right now. Um, so the SDK, um, we've seen the, uh, in the animation of the, of the optical uh, system, uh, is very much uh, just calculating the interference pattern from the 3D content and talking to the display. That's how simple it is, um, and that's why also those optical systems can be very simple for, for CGH. You don't need to create new content, you can use off-the-shelf uh, displays, um, and you get the end result depending on the on the optical arrangement that's, that you have either behind the combiner or in front of the display uh, behind the windshield for, for augmented reality um, head-up displays. 
Um, but then on top of it, on top of the SDK, especially in the past uh, two, three years, we have been focusing as well on developing designs for, for hardware. So uh, anyone who has worked with ODMs um, knows that uh, just dropping an SDK is usually not going to do that. So we have developed a range of proprietary um, hardware designs as well to effectively complement uh, this complete solution for, um, for AR wearable development. Um, and uh, again, unsurprisingly, uh, we are one of the leaders in this space um, submitting uh, patents both on uh, the applications of our algorithms, but also um, recently predominantly on the, on the hardware uh, IP. Um, and uh, we also have a team of uh, dedicated engineers that are involved in those projects and are helping to deliver the end products. Um, so the thing that we are focusing on very much at AWE this year uh, is breaking into this new frontier. So um, since CGH is providing so many of those great capabilities to, to AR wearables, uh, we are effectively taking up a challenge of, um, of sorting out AR gaming and AR ent entertainment. Um, so we are very much focusing on the, on the product bundle called uh, VividQ Alpha at the moment. This is the, uh, the set of algorithms and the designs which allow manufacturers to build the gaming headset that people always wanted. So in its first version, it's going to focus on, uh, on benchtop uh, type of content. So um, again, a very new area for us. Uh, we haven't been doing much content in-house. We still are not planning to do much content in-house, but um, we are partnering up with companies who want to develop the most immersive AR gaming experiences. And um, I guess your holographic display Warhammer is very much coming up um, as part of this, as this bundle. Um, so again, at AWE this year, we released the spec of the device um, that will be delivering um, early next year. Um, so as you can see, um, of course, the display element is the, is the biggest uh, point from, uh, from our perspective and the capabilities of it. Um, we are going to uh, aim for, um, for competitive field of view and, and iBox using our 3D waveguide solution while returning the full 3D uh, capability of the, of the display. Um, we um, are effectively um, going to, to match the, the resolution uh, specs and, the, um, and include all the integrations that we, that we already have in some of the prototypes uh, in-house, but really focusing on this gaming experience that is going to make the real difference between the headsets that are currently available and the holographic solution that, that VividQ delivers. So where do we go from there? Um, of course, going untethered is going to be the, the next step. Uh, this is going to um, require some work um, around figuring out how we can use local compute um, over Wi-Fi, making sure that um, you can deliver this, this real-time 3D experience, um, which is untethered but still, but still location-based, uh, while retaining this uh, super high resolution uh, with, with full depth of, um, of field. Uh, but the thing that we're obviously excited the most about is VividQ Omega. Uh, and this is um, the product that um, will be effectively uh, delivering on all the requirements of the gamers in the AR and VR space. Um, and uh, if you're asking why we, we are not jumping straight away into that, um, we will need to develop dedicated SOCs in order to make it happen. Having an untethered device that is supporting the new type of display will require some, some custom solutions that we are looking for, uh, for partners to develop um, with. Um, again, we are not developing hardware in-house. Uh, we are uh, licensing our solutions and will hope to work with a very strong manufacturing partner to develop this extremely immersive, hyper-realistic experience with, with full depth of field. Um, so I just wanted to say a couple of words about our team. So uh, we are uh, 41 and some of our engineers like to climb trees. Um, we um, are based in London, Cambridge and in, in Tokyo and we originated at the photonics department at the University of, um, of Cambridge. Um, so far we have been um, equity funded, um, raised some monies from deep tech investors and we are very proud to deliver some of those solutions with, uh, with our partners that, um, that effectively make it, make it all happen. 
Um, so very quickly, what's next? Um, apart from the AR wearable dev kit that I discussed uh, mostly in this presentation, we have two um, other major applications that uh, we are branching out um, in 2022. Uh, um, so the first one is around automotive development kits. Again, I probably don't have to explain how much benefit having a genuine 3D image in a HUD as you're driving a car uh, actually has for, for the safety and uh, kind of usefulness of the device. You do not want to project on the windshield, you want information on the road uh, being kind of word locked to what's going on on the road. And eventually, hollow LCD. Um, it is, uh, it is a, a CGI concept for now, but I very much want to have the alien claw coming out of the screen um, within the next um, two years uh, in a gaming laptop. So if there is anyone who would like to develop it with us, please um, let us know. Um, and if you'd like to learn more, uh, we have a white paper on CGH, uh, especially in the AR wearable space on our website. Uh, we uh, effectively describe in a little bit more detail how uh, we uh, approach CGH, um, both from the algorithmic and design perspective, um, and how you can integrate some of those um, products uh, into, into your devices. Um, so thank you very much. Awesome. Okay, um, unfortunately we don't have time for questions. I see what you did there. You're getting people to go to your booth. I get it, I get it. So if you have Welcome. questions, it's open till three, I believe today. Yeah. And uh, your booth is? Um, 936. There it is right there. Um, cool. So check that out for sure and ask cool, questions. Thank you. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was very exciting. Thanks everybody.